All right. It is four o'clock PM on the East Coast of the United States where I am, and it is 9 a.m. in Auckland, New Zealand, according to my iPhone. So welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're really excited today to talk about the update of the F751 Kiwi Fruit Quality Meter. Before we get started, I want to just cover a little bit of light housekeeping. Today, our moderator is Hunter. He is our marketing coordinator at Felix Instruments and CID Bioscience. Uh, Hunter is going to be the one that's moderating the chat. He'll be posting any kind of relevant links. Uh, so if there's any links in the presentation, he'll post those in the chat so that you can click on those. You're not going to be able to interact with them on my presentation. So that's where they will be. If you guys uh, need to communicate with us that we're having technical issues, if you can't hear me, if the video goes out or if the presentation goes away, please use the chat feature for uh, for those kinds of uh, notifications. If you have questions that pertain to the actual content of this presentation, then please utilize the Q&A function. At the end of the presentation, I will be opening up that Q&A function and going through all the questions one by one and answering those. So if you post your question into the chat, then I likely won't see it and I won't be able to answer it. But always be you know, aware that if you do have questions, if you think of questions after this, or if you had a question that got lost in the, in the mix, then please just feel free to reach out to us directly. And I'm happy to answer any questions after this presentation um, through email uh, or through a video call or, or anything like that. So for any of you that aren't familiar with who I am, uh, my name is Galen. I am the Director of Applied Science here at Felix Instruments. I've been with the company for five years now. My degrees are in biochemistry and food science. Uh, I'm an IFT certified food scientist, and my background is mostly in quality and safety assessment in the food, agriculture, and cannabis industries. And what I wanted to do today is a little bit of a departure from, from what we've done in previous webinars. If you haven't joined one of our webinars before, um, uh, one that kind of goes along with this a little bit that you might interest you is our whole series on chemometrics and modeling and how we actually do the modeling process for uh, these devices, the F750 and the F751. Um, but what I wanted to do today was just kind of give you some background on our company in case you aren't familiar with who we are. So we are Felix Instruments and we were established in 2012. Uh, we are a, a sister company or a subsidiary company of CID Bioscience. And so CID Bioscience was uh, founded in 1989 and it started as a company that created non-destructive research, scientific research tools for plant research uh, and plant phenotyping. Um, and so we've what we've done in, since 2012 is we've applied that knowledge that we gained over uh, catering to plant researchers and the agriculture and the ecology uh, and the environmental sciences uh, kind of uh, realms, we've taken that knowledge and we've applied it to this new technology, this NIR spectroscopy technology, to help us create these cutting edge non-destructive tools for the produce sectors of the agricultural industry. And the way we've done that, we've we've been able to do this, basically this innovation through collaboration with top researchers and industry leaders across the globe. And so we really want to make this technology as uh, with a global approach in mind and and everything that we do we want to make sure that it caters to regions all across the world and so that's what we've taken as an our approach and the other thing that to note is that everything we do all the engineering the design the manufacturing the research everything takes place in house at our headquarters in Camas Washington in the Pacific Northwest of the United States uh, uh, we the way that we actually are able to access all corners of the globe is through our distribution partners. And so we've got distribution partners worldwide that allow uh, anyone anywhere to access our technology um, and also give them localized support and sales uh, uh, help. And so the, in New Zealand specifically, we have Matt Solutions. Uh, they're based in Christchurch and they are a, t a company that's very familiar with NIR technology. They've been dealing with that for a while. And they also have a lot of expertise in the food industry and shelf life testing and things of that nature. And um, so they're our local distributor for New Zealand. Um, and the other aspect of this is that 
New Zealand isn't the only region we cater to, obviously. So we actually have devices that are deployed over to over 500 companies and or 500 customers in over 100 different countries. And we have features in over 200 different peer reviewed publications. And so these devices have been really tried and tested across uh, multiple different regions and, and, and across time to you know really become the robust technology that they are now. And the technology that I'm referring to in that whole section was the F750 and the F751. So these are our near infrared spectroscopy instruments. They're portable quality sensors. And so what that means is we're using near infrared spectroscopy in combination with a robust chemometric calibration to enable users to acquire data non-destructively of internal fruit quality indicators. So we're shining light in the visible and near infrared spectrums into the actual mesocarp tissue of the fruit and we're getting information about the chemical constituents and the physicochemical properties inside of that fruit without having to actually cut it open or do anything, any kind of destructive assessment. And so this technology really is a combination, a marriage of the hardware aspect, the actual spectroscopy kind of aspect of it. But then there's also this really complex process of, of creating these chemometric models. So that's kind of where we have to find this balance and where we find most of the improvement coming from uh, in recent years is on the chemometric side of things. And so that's what we're gonna be talking today about uh, in later slides is I'll be showing you how we've improved the actual quality of the models themselves with the uh, kind of actions that we've taken to increase uh, our data flow. But before we get there, I also want to just kind of lay out why you might be interested in this technology, what kind of benefits it can provide to you. So the very first thing I've already mentioned this a couple of times, I've said this, this buzzword a couple of times, is that it's non-destructive, right? We're eliminating food waste for one thing. We're eliminating the actual waste as for, in the form of the cost of the produce that you're destroying when you do your quality testing. But then we're also enabling you to go out and take measurements and take as many measurements as you want um, without having to worry about, you know, wasting that fruit and not being able to monitor it again at a later point in time. So it enables you to actually see progression of these fruit traits in the same exact fruit over time, which is something that's really unique. And, and and at the current state with the technology and the destructive methods that are being used is just not possible. So that's one benefit of this, of this technology. The other is the accuracy. So right now we have the ability to utilize in this great age of technology, we have uh, AI and machine learning methods that we can utilize to actually improve the performance of the models. So this technology, spectroscopy has been around for a while, but we also haven't really had the, I guess, the software kind of AI technical capabilities to make these giant kind of data, you know, databases that allow us to incorporate tons of different variability and allow AI to learn how all these different little variables, things like regionality, seasonality, temperature, variety, all sorts of different, you know, what stage of maturity the fruit is at, all these different variables, the models now can learn how these different variables impact the actual spectra that's received by the instrument and allow us to incorporate and build all those different variables and build these more robust data sets. And so the accuracy is improving because we're able to actually use it the technology in a wide variety of situations now and not be worried about whether or not it's going to be less accurate or more accurate in this situation because we've built up this large database. Whereas in the past, NIR calibrations are typically very specific to a singular you know, condition, environmental condition. It's very controlled kind of in conditions, but this allows us to use it in a variety of applications. And that leads us to the versatility. So these instruments can be used out in the field. They can be used in the pack house, at the retail outlet. As an importer, you can use it to inspect incoming lots. 
all sorts of different applications, really any point in that food supply chain. And the reason we're able to do that is because of these really robust data sets. We've also integrated some features into the device itself to allow for compensation for different lighting conditions and, and things of that nature. So we've got this great marriage of, we, you know, we can deal and compensate for all these different variabilities that might be present in your specific situation. So what we're trying to do is create this, this product that works for everyone in any situation. And lastly, what this can give you is just a wealth of insights. This technology, because it's non-destructive, because of all these things I've mentioned before, it allows you to go out and, and rethink how you sample. So, and, you know, and traditionally, we're sampling as little fruit as we can while still trying to maintain representation in our sample set. But the reality is we're never going to be able to hit that representation mark because we're always going to be encouraged to reduce our waste or reduce our costs of testing or costs of wasting fruit. So now what this technology allows you to do is go out and actually sample as many fruit as you want to try to get as a better, more representative idea of what's going on with the fruit that is in your field, in your orchard, or the incoming fruit that's coming from the orchards or whatever you're importing. All that allows you to go out and sample more and get a and be more informed, essentially. So this technology has been really groundbreaking for for the agricultural field, because it's just, it's, it's a total change up to what we've been doing for the last, you know, 30 years now. So when I, I've been talking a lot about the modeling and I haven't really explained too much about what goes into that modeling besides we're building up big data sets and we're, we're adding a whole bunch of data from different regions and seasons and things like that. But I wanted to give you a specific look into how we've been developing these models and be as transparent as we can. So specifically for New Zealand, what we've been doing is um, working really closely with a independent third party, uh, a, a collaborator of ours called Startafresh. And so they are a totally unbiased independent uh, uh, unit that is actually investigating multiple different kinds of spectroscopy pieces of equipment. Um, and in that we were a part of that kind of investigation. And this started back uh, in the earliest uh, data collection was back in 2020. So with the F750 and the F751, we were, uh, Startafresh was helping us to collect both spectral data and reference data using the current standardized methods for reference testing uh, from, you know, early season through to, you know, the harvest stage and even some post-harvest data. So from 2020 all the way now through 2023 and continuing on in 2024, we've been collecting data. And in 2020, we just did gold and green. And in 2021 is when we started collecting red kiwi fruit data. So right now in this updated model, we have four seasons worth of data in the gold and the green models. And we have three seasons now worth of data in the red kiwi fruit. And I'll show you the impact that those have towards the end of this presentation. But um, there is uh, some significant differences that you'll see, especially in the red kiwi fruit now that we've added in a third season. Um, so just something to note how we built the models. Uh, I will also mention later, but New Zealand isn't the only region that we're catering to, it is just uh, you know, one of the largest kiwi fruit growing regions in the world. And we are, um, you know, uh, collecting a massive amount of data from them, but we do have data from other regions in our model as well, which I'll mention later. So I want to get into the nitty gritty details of, of exactly what performance looks like and how we measure performance of our models. And I want to explain this graph, the statistics to you and everything. Um, so let's just start off by going with the table to the right. I'll explain some of the statistics to you. And from there, I will explain what this graph means and, uh, and kind of how we interpret this graph that we, that we, that we create and how we actually even created it. That being said, I'm not going to go through, we have an entire internal validation document that I've put together. Uh, that goes through every single model that we have. And so 
if you want to view that and review all of the different models and look at all these performance statistics, that will be available for download online from our website. If you so, but for the, the sake of keeping this presentation not, you know, two and a half hours long, we are going to only focus on a few of the, we're going to, I'm actually just going to focus on dry matter for gold, red, and green, and just kind of show you an example for each of what we did for our validation testing. So in a validation, what we're doing, just kind of some background of in a validation, we are taking a su small subset of data from the most recent season, 2023. And what we're doing is we're removing it from the model training set. So the data that's actually used to create the model, we're, we're taking a small subset of data out of that and putting it aside and we're building the model independently. And then we're gonna take this data and we're gonna test it against the model and see how it performs. And so what that's what we've done here. And I've split it up in a way that we're actually looking at the two different instrument types, F750 and F751. And we're comparing those performances as well as looking at the overall accuracy. So in the table we're looking at, we have the average for the data sets, the standard deviation, and then we have the RMS EV, which is the root mean square error of the validation set. And so this statistic is very important to us. The RMS EV is to be considered essentially the average error that you can expect. So imagine if you see a statistic in a publication that says, you know, the we're confident that this prediction, that this uh, reading was 1.0 plus or minus and then there's an error. That's kind of what you what we interpret this uh, value can be interpreted as. So RMSE is what you would consider as the error of the instrument. The R squared. Most of you are probably familiar with the R squared statistic. It's a correlation coefficient. Um, and then RPD is a statistic that we use that is not necessarily a. It's a it's a unitless measure. It's essentially looking at the. Uh, the RMSE in comparison to the standard deviation. So what we're looking at is, is the RMSE low, is the error low in comparison to the standard deviation? And for the RPD, a, a, a value of 1.5 or higher means that the, the uh, predictions of this, of this model are really robust and they, they are, the error is essentially much lower than the standard deviation. And so that's a uh, higher RPD is better always. So that being said, if we look at our gold dry matter model right here, we can see that both the F750 and the F751 data sets align very well with each other. They're not drastically different. They're, they have no uh, difference in bias. Right? So there's not one data set that's predicting much higher than the other one or anything like that. They're both predicting very uh, similarly. The data sets that were used, the reference data sets, you can see that the averages were both very similar. Uh, it's represented across as wide of a range as we can, as we basically can uh, measure. So from around a little over 10 to 22, dry matter. And what we're seeing is the standard deviations are slightly lower in our in the instrument, the predicted uh, versus the reference method, but pretty much very similar. Uh, which is uh, a good, a very good sign. And then our RMSEs, which is what we think is almost the most critical thing for us, is very, very good. So we're seeing very similar performance, both with an error of you know around 0 0.7, 0 0.66 for the 750, 0.71 for the F751. So that's saying that on a given prediction for a single measurement that you can expect that if you were to then take that exact same fruit and measure it analytically, by slicing the center out and then drying it in a dehydrator and weighing it and finding the loss in weight uh, from during the drying process that you would get a value from that reference process. You would get a value that's within plus or minus 0.66 of, or sorry, I guess reverse of that. This prediction from the instrument would be within plus or minus 0.66 of whatever that reference value was. So very, very accurate for our dry matter models and very similar performance out of the instruments. Our R squares are really high, almost 0.9, which means that we have a really good correlation, strong correlation in this data. 
And our RPDs are all above 1.5. These are almost at three. So that's really, really means that this is a really, really robust model. For our green model, we have, uh, so it's the same kind of graph. You can see there's a little bit more spread here, a little bit more variation. Um, and that's mostly in our F751. So the F751 is around 0.8 for our RMSE. Uh, and uh, 0.66 is the same uh, value as it was for the gold. So it's also at a 0.66 RMSE. Our standard deviations, once again, match up really well with our reference method. Our R squared values are very high, still 0.83 and 0.9 for the F750. Um, so both of these, again, predicting very similarly, both giving very accurate uh, results. And uh, both, you know, I would trust either of these instruments to be predicting green dry matter. RPDs, again, really high. And then our red model. So our red model now is at a RMSE of around 0 0.8, 0 0.78, 0 0.77. Um, and so we're looking at an error, an average error that's much lower than it was in last season, which you'll see here in the next slide. R squared is again around 0.9. Uh, I, I guess I, I wouldn't be exaggerating when I say that these kinds of models are, this is kind of the ideal model to see when you're building models for NI, an NIR spectroscopy applications. Um, these very, very uh, uh, good correlations that are on a, you know, a one, a one-to-one -one slope, and they're all really tightly packed on that line. It's really an ideal situation to be in. So these models have been trained enough that um, uh, they are now able to compensate for all sorts of conditions because these are a random data set. So this data contains data that is from, you know, different fields, different conditions, different times, uh, different phases throughout the maturity process. So, that, you know, it's totally random, but this model has been able to compensate for all those variables and is still able to predict really well um, on, a, on a single scan basis. Now, comparing where we're at since last year, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that we are essentially stable from for the gold and green models for dry matter and bricks from 2023 to 2024. Now, this to me is an indicator that we are at a point where it's going to be difficult to overcome that inherent inaccuracies that are in the reference method. Uh, once you start getting low enough, you know, there, it's essentially impossible for us to have a zero error because there's inherent inaccuracies in the actual reference method itself. So for us to be able to do a errorless measurement with the NIR spectroscopy uh, is just not feasible. So we're getting to a point where it seems like we're kind of just in a stable stability, you know, area where we're not seeing much improvement in the dry matter and bricks, but we also have now the ability to explore even more complex AI and machine learning methods. And so what we're looking at right now with uh, some research partners in Australia and central Queensland is looking at other types of neural networks. Um, and how those can improve the performance of our models. Um, so what we're going to see is from here is most likely just some more improvement, but up to a threshold. There's always going to be a threshold that we can't overcome um, because there is, as I mentioned, inaccuracy in the reference method itself. Um, that being said, you know, it's really good accuracy that we're seeing out of these instruments. Um, you know, we're seeing for bricks, even, you know, everything's at, you know, one, pretty much exactly one or under. Um, uh, and uh, for Hue, that was one that we actually did see pretty good improvement from 2023 to 2024. So in the gold Hue, you see that we've now reduced our, our error down to about 1.2, 1.3. Uh, and so that is a, a major improvement from the previous year of two, you know, being over two uh, in the accuracy. So being able to more accurately assess the internal flesh color of those gold kiwi fruit uh, with the devices now. Um, so the major, I guess, uh, kind of revelation here is that, you know, adding in the fourth season of data may, might not have increased the accuracy significantly for gold and green. 
But what it's doing is it's building up that robustness, that resiliency to predicting future seasons. So when this device is now used to predict for this season or for next season, it's going to be much more accurate and not require as much updating and fine tuning and all of those things. It's going to be a much more robust model. And the thing that's probably going to be what helps us improve it is going to be further research into more complex machine learning methodologies. Um, the data collection at this point, um, building up a larger data set, isn't necessarily going to improve the model significantly. It might allow us to uh, get some more representation, but even then uh, it's not going to, I guess, necessarily improve the model significantly in any way. Um, the big update here is that the red kiwi fruit has improved pretty significantly. So we went from last year, the, the, the model only had two seasons worth of data, right? 2021 and 2022. And uh, our dry matter RMSEs were above one. Everything was kind of sitting above one for bricks as well. Um, and this year, when we went and updated it, our RMSEs are now 0.8 for less than 0.8 for dry matter. And we're sitting below one for our bricks uh, values, uh, for our bricks RMSEs. So that's great. The little bit of glaring, I guess, kind of uh, information here that everyone might be kind of concerned about is this hue reading for the red kiwi fruit. Now, this is kind of an experimental model that we decided to just pursue because we were collecting the data for it anyways. Um, but for the red hue, it's just an, an, a monumentally complex fruit to measure with a reference method, which is a usually a colorimeter. Um, because coloration is is so variable within the fruit itself with the red kiwi fruit, it's impossible for us to use our instrument as a direct comparison to the colorimeter. The colorimeter is a much scan, smaller scan window. It's only getting a very specific point of the flesh, which might have a little bit of gold, a little bit of red in it. Um, but when we use our device, it's really getting a, a much bigger picture. Uh, and so that is why we're not, we're really not seeing much accuracy um, at all from this around 15, uh, which is in hue, it's in hue angles. So uh, 15 degrees of uh, accuracy here. Um, so that will, you know, we'll continue to explore that route. But uh, as far as I know right now, that's not really uh, um, something that's really critical for, for people that are growing red kiwi fruit to understand um, quite yet. I, I'm sure that they'll nail down a process uh, for a reference methodology uh, sometime in the near future. And once that is uh, occurs, then we will be able to kind of build up this model a lot more. But overall, really happy with the performance of these models. I mean, everything being at pretty much at or below one for uh, accuracy uh, as far as uh, you know, the, the RMSE values are concerned. Uh, that's just really great performance overall. Now, what are we going to do in the future from here? Where are we going from here? So the uh, industry itself, you know, uh, as, as industry members that are on this, on this webinar right now, you have, you know, some decisions to make after this information that I've presented to you. Uh, this technology really lends itself as a excellent monitoring tool for your harvest monitoring, you know, it can help reduce your testing costs. It can allow you to get better insights so you know exactly when you need to send fruit into test to get that go ahead to harvest. Um, for the post-harvest supply chain, you know, it's just allowing you to sample at a much higher rate so you really are confident in the fruit that you are receiving, that it's of the highest possible quality. Same with importers and, and all sorts of things. And even laboratories can help use this as a, as a kind of uh, a monitoring or assessment tool in, in, in their own way to help them uh, kind of scale, you know, scale their operations as well. So what we need to do moving forward, I've already mentioned we've been building up these really robust data sets. Uh, I also told you I would mention other regions that we do include in our model. So we have collected data from uh, some data from South Korea. We've collected data from Italy. We've collected data from Chilean uh, fruit, uh, uh, Greece as well. 
Um, but uh, what we're doing now is we're ex we need to expand our horizons more. And so we need to continue to collect that data set, but from a wider range. So, you know, France uh, is, a, is a major growing region as well that we need to collect data from. So we're going to continue to pursue those leads to make sure that these models are continuously updated and improved and that they work really well for everyone. That being said, regionality and the kiwi fruit uh, may or may not present itself as much of an issue with this device. It really requires us to have to go out there and do some actual testing and, and do some experimentation. So um, what we'll do in the future is, you know, continue to update these models as we have, we'll, you know, from our partners, every time we collect data, we always will use that to update our models and provide these updates for free. Um, and then we'll also be exploring, like I said, those advanced, uh, more advanced neural network machine learning approaches to chemometrics to help improve this model performance. So really what you can be sure of is that the quality, uh, the accuracy that I just showed you, the accuracy that's in the report, the independent report that I've uh, put out on our website, you can be sure that things are only going to continue to get better. And in this case, in some cases, like from last year to this year, at, at the very least remain stable um, where they are at. Things aren't going to get worse. And so... Um, that's kind of the message that I wanted to put out is that we're at this level where we're getting really great accuracy now for the kiwi fruit. This is a technology that's very mature at this point. It's now four years in the making. We're in our fifth year of data collection. We have data that we're collecting right now actively uh, for the red kiwi fruit. Um, and we're also doing some more testing. So really this product is gone from something that was, you know, just an idea. It's now this very, very mature product that is ready to be used in all sorts of different applications. And so if you have questions about whether or not this, how this will fit into your operation, um, you know, if you have your own quality management system or your own farm uh, management system that you want this <clears throat> data to be automatically integrated into, we can do things like that. We have all sorts of options for uh, for um, anyone that's really going to be handling kiwi fruit at any point in the supply chain. So uh, we're really excited to continue to see this this technology grow, and we're putting every effort into making making sure that it works for everyone as best as it possibly can. And we're really committed to that that mission. So really excited about this. We're happy to be you know releasing this. This will be available uh, to download this uh, uh, app. If you already own a device, you can download the app and just re replace the old app on your device or put it, you know, just put the new app on and delete the old app. Um, and if you are interested in purchasing a Kiwi fruit meter, uh, or if you're just interested in pricing, um, any new shipments of these will all have this brand new model on them. Uh, and so you can be rest assured that everything will have the latest and greatest on it when it gets shipped out. But Hunter will post this uh, link on the chat. And if you want to just get pricing, or if you want to just, you know, uh, get some questions answered uh, offline, then feel free to click that link and, and fill out some information and, and we'll get in touch with you and help uh, make sure that we can properly inform you on, on how this technology can be utilized in your specific application. Uh, otherwise, you know, we have a lot of other exciting things uh, coming soon. Um, on the note of farm management systems, we do have an upcoming uh, release for a, a big update to our fruit maps platform, which is a orchard management system. Uh, it's a software online application that you can use to track all of your harvest information. And so that will be coming soon. So please follow us on our social media or just check out our website Sign up for our newsletter. Or we have great newsletters, a lot of really interesting uh, uh, publications that we we discuss in our newsletters. Um, uh, you can do that through our website. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for joining today. I'm going to go ahead and open up the Q&A and answer any questions you have. And uh, Hunter, if you could, if you want to just throw my email up in the chat uh, so people have access to be able to email me if they want um, questions. Uh, if they think of them after the, the session today, then I'm happy to answer those. Uh, the first question is, oh, this is a great question. And I'm glad this is this was asked. Uh, does the F750 need to be updated, uh, the firmware? 
does the firmware need to be updated to use the new Kiwi models? So this app is using the same firmware that we've been using uh, for uh, a while now. So there should be no firmware update needed if you are on the latest firmware already that is available on our website. Uh, if you have already updated your unit, then, then there will be no other further updates needed. It's just a simple copy and paste the new app file onto your SD card of your device. The next question, uh, what are the prediction ranges, the minimum and to maximum values for uh, the uh, dry matter and the soluble solids? I'm guessing is what that, the DS and the SS. Um, so uh, for dry matter, it depends on which variety we're looking at, um, but typically we're looking at anywhere from like 10 to mid twenties for dry matter. Uh, for bricks, actually much low, we, uh, much lower, uh, so probably around three to four up to uh, the 20s, uh, up to, you know, up to like the low 20s for bricks. Um, and that is dependent on which variety, but uh, most of them have approximately that range. But you'll be able to see from the uh, the independent validation report that I that I put up on the website, um, you'll be able to see from that on those graphs, the ranges, because the validation sets we use encompass the entire range of uh, possible prediction. So in the that, that range that's covered is the minimum and maximum values of that range. So that was a great question. Thank you. Both those are really good questions. Appreciate it. So if we don't have any other questions, we can go ahead and wrap up. I just want to thank everyone again. Oh, we have one more here. Uh, did you include pre-harvest readings and how long in storage did you follow the fruit? So pre-harvest readings, yes, that was really the initial uh, kind of goal of this technology was only to be used in this pre-harvest application. But then we kind of expanded it into the more post-harvest stuff as well. So everything we've done um, for data collection has been uh, included from early, early season pre-harvest, like all the way through uh, basically to the post-harvest stage. Now in post-harvest, that's kind of where it gets a little more, a little messier. We've done studies where we're putting things in cold store and we're taking things out and taking, you know, at different temperatures, uh, basically to help, in, you know, and build that temperature variability into the models. We've also uh, done a lot of uh, post-harvest uh, retail, actual like retail outlet testing where we're going out and from retail outlets, we're, we're picking fruit and we're testing it in our laboratory in-house. Um, so we've really kind of got everything up through that, you know, everything from the early stage all the way through to the very end consumer endpoint um, in that, in that uh, range. All right, so if there are no other questions, then we'll go ahead and end today's webinar. But like I said, if you have any, if you think of any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can reach out to me directly if you would like, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, also, if you are interested in the modeling stuff, uh, all the modeling things that I talked about, we do have a really comprehensive webinar series on our YouTube page that covers all the basics that you need to know about how modeling is conducted with NIR spectroscopy, all the considerations you have to make and everything, uh, very comprehensive and um, very useful to help learn about this technology and how it works. So, all right, well, that being said, thank you everybody and uh, have a great rest of your day.